Hello and welcome to The Bestseller Experiment, where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark Stay. And I'm Mark DeVoe, and we'd like to say thank you to every single person out there in the universe and beyond that supports this podcast, to our patrons, our lovely patrons who support this podcast every week, and also to our Academy members, and especially our new Academy members that have been joining the last couple of weeks. Welcome to everyone. It's so lovely to have you all. And Mr. Stay, what an insane week <laughs> last week that we had. Yeah, Whose idea was that then? We're, yeah, it was mine. Uh, we haven't we haven't spoken since the live show, have we? I I, I'm fascinated to know what it was like from your end. What because you were just sort of this big head <laughs> staring down at us like you know George Orwell's Big Brother. Um, what was it like, uh, especially in the run up to to us kicking off as well? Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because like pod, a new thing that you, a lot of people are seeing now with podcasts are these you know podcasts going on tour and doing live shows. And obviously, like us, with the two of us, a lot of people may not know this if you're just new to the podcast, but Mark and I, despite the accents, live many, many miles <laughs> apart. I live in the west coast of Canada, and Mark lives in the east, the southeast of the UK. And so we, we, we've done this podcast uh, remotely, the two of us, mm. even though we sound like we're in a room chatting away with a nice cup of Horlicks, we are actually millions of miles apart, it feels. So... It, we decided it would be kind of fun to to try and bring me into a live show in Waterstone. So for anyone that hasn't listened to it, we had four amazing authors. And thank you to all the authors that, that came. They were brilliant, weren't they, Mark? They were, fa- they were absolutely fantastic. And they they made the show what it was. So, absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. And so we, we had we had amazing authors. We had we, But there were, what people don't realize is behind the scenes, this was like a Hollywood production. <laughs> like, seriously, I had no idea we did a dry run the day before and I was sitting there thinking, well, it, it works. It looks like it's working, but it, you, you think, oh, it's just a Zoom call. It's not just a Zoom call. Like Mark, Mark how many mics and leads and box splitters and internet connections and backup phone? I mean, it was insane, wasn't it? It was it was uh, it was like an explosion at Radio Shack. There were cables everywhere, <laughs> and this is why I have to salute Douglas uh, Douglas yes. Ray, our tech guy. He he was cool as a cucumber. He this was really difficult because you once you start getting sound, you start getting sound loops and echoes and feedback and stuff like that. And he worked really hard to to figure that out. I so um, in the room it was absolutely brilliant. I know on YouTube it was a bit roomy, as they say, a bit echoey, um, but actually in in the room at waterstones it was just fantastic it was Do you know what um, the funniest bit though was mark is that and i didn't realize this but we so for people i mean i won't go into the technology of it because that'll probably bore people to death but just just the drama of it so i'm sitting in my studio in canada and a half an hour before we've tested all the connections because it would be fine if we weren't streaming it live online as well as doing multi-cameras like yeah. you know in in the in the actual Waterstones shop with with a live audience, mm. but the crazy bit was is what I didn't realise is we had we had a test link didn't we for, for yeah. the online and then we had a live link and I said about fifteen minutes before I said we probably should switch to the live link uh, just so we're all ready and when we switched to the live link I could not see or hear anything that was going on in Waterstones <laughs> before I had I had I had like the st- live stream so I could see what like, I could chat with you Mark and I could talk over the speakers and everything the minute we switched to that that live link everything went black and I started uh-huh. panic <laughs> so imagine the scene right imagine the scene I'm sitting there thinking okay, uh, I guess it's going to all happen when the live stream happens. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, what if it doesn't? <laughs> it's like, so I, I, I texted Doug, our tech guy, and I said, uh, Doug said, is, is, this in, is this what happens? Like, is it just going to, is it just suddenly going to appear? Like, uh, and he said, yeah, theoretically. And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> theoretically. <laughs> anyway, so I'm just sitting there and I look at the clock and it's literally gone half an hour. It's like 30 which we, when we were starting, we were starting yeah. the show on half and then nothing happened. And I'm like, oh no. And then literally two seconds later, I hear this three, two, one, <laughs> and you came on screen and everyone's cheering and I could hear everything. I could see myself on the screen. And I, I tell you what, you wouldn't see it on the video, but the amount of relief I felt in that moment <laughs> was massive. And in then you Doug talked to me. Trust. Yes. And, and you, were, you were just as relieved when you, when you turned up to the big screen and said, Mr. Vogue, can you hear us? 
And I went, I can hear you from Canada land or something. And you're like, I could just see the relief. And there's a photo of you, isn't there? Of yeah. your face. It's just like, <laughs> thank God. So you wouldn't well, have to was, wing it all by yourself. Well, the other thing that happened, which listeners won't know about, is Nadine Matheson, one of our authors, was stuck in traffic. So she turned up two minutes before the start as well. <laughs> she came she came running in. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Because, you know, you, you can't phone while you're driving. That's illegal in the UK. So yeah. you, know, you can't phone ahead or anything like that. So, you know... Nadine turned up just a couple of minutes before. So, yeah, but, you know, these are the things that it's, we live for. You know, this is do. all the fun of the circus. You know, this is, it oh, is. I love it. It was and great. And actually, so. in the, the, fact that, the fact that, you know, it kind of in some ways shows you what's possible beyond just an audio podcast. I mean, we now, we now go on YouTube as well for people that don't know that. You can watch us chatting to each other on, on YouTube. But um, I just think it's, it's for, I just want to, I just want to take a moment just to go, isn't it incredible that we have the technology today um, to do this kind of crazy stuff? Um, because 20 years ago, and actually we'll hear about in our interview, someone that started out on the internet 20 years ago, or even <laughs> longer, which is how I started my life out as well. But I, I really appreciate, I remember the days, Mark, when we used to get 28K modems. Do you remember those dial-up modems oh, yeah, when the yeah, internet yeah. first started yeah. with the funny noise? Yeah, yeah. And and look at us now chatting online and been we a couldn't have, to the world. We couldn't have done this five six years ago when the podcast started. I don't very think true. We could have done it. No, yeah, we couldn't. The technology. I don't think the kit kit was there. I don't think the kit no, was the there. No, the bandwidth so. and everything else. Yeah, it's amazing. So thank you to everyone in the world who has contributed towards development of this incredible technology. Because you know what, we do take it for granted, don't we? I mean, you're now doing internet via some space station in yes yes i've got starlink I've finally <laughs> fixed my rural broadband i can watch netflix in confidence and do this without yeah, it, 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 it. yeah. yeah so delays. that's amazing yeah but so, yes, so uh, isn't it amazing i just want to take a moment just to... huge thanks i mean i know i said it on the podcast but huge thanks to doug and kai and emily and martin the manager and to our authors uh so we had rowan and we had panilla and we had nadine and we had julie wasma uh, and everyone who came and everyone who came along and everyone who watched it was the most extraordinary night it was quite amazing what was uh, it like we meeting been... some of your some, some of the podcast listeners as well because that's something oh, that... so lovely i mean these are you know faces and voices that we've seen online i got um Andrew Chapman signed my copy of the, the Mask Collector, which I still haven't read. I'm so sorry, Andrew, but he has signed it and he's put on the front here. What did he put? Um, this is all your fault. So that's nice. <laughs> that's um, a good one. So yeah, uh, so it was just so lovely. And they were meeting each other for the first time, a lot of them as well. So we had a little group photo and stuff like that. So it was Brilliant. it was terrific. It was such a wonderful event. Not one I'm going to be doing every week. It, you know, I lo I've lost a lot of weight in the last couple of months, I think partly because of this event. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was terrific. It was really great. really good fun. Well, here's here's something to put out. You know, I'm I'm all about visualization and putting it out in the universe. Here's something I'm going to ask all our listeners to think about. Wouldn't it be cool one day? And I'm not. This is not going to happen at all. But I'm just saying, wouldn't it be lovely if everyone shared the podcast with so many people that eventually we could maybe do a little kind of bestseller experiment or maybe. Maybe North America, maybe somewhere around England. I think that would be fun to do. But people have to spread the word because we need to get, you know, you need to get enough people in each place. Bums on seats. Yeah. Like I discovered there's something the other day called Songkick. I don't know if you ever heard of that, Mr. Stay. Songkick. Mm. No. Songkick is a cool website where you can, if you want to see a, a band play live in your town, you can say, I live here, come, come here. Oh, wow. And I typed in our, I typed in Urban Myth Club, my band, right? Just I yeah. thought, what the chances, right? Well, <laughs> apparently there are thousands of people around the world waiting for us to play live in this. And I, had, I didn't even know that wow. this. Yeah, I didn't even know this thing existed. But because we've released albums, you know, put albums out there, we, we got sucked into the database and people have obviously like, you know. Anyway, so I thought, I wonder if there's a podcast version of that. That'd be kind of cool where you say, I want bestseller yeah. experiment to come to my town. But, but yeah, so spread the word, everyone. If you want us to one day in the future um do a little tour i'd love to do that because it'd be fun just to do it together and then we wouldn't have all the technical yeah shenanigans exactly yeah. As well, right? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well he yeah. says he says that but there'll probably be something else to worry about but <laughs> anyway anyway it was a lot of fun and thank you to everyone that came on because i was like running the online chat yeah and it was lovely chatting with loads of people from all over there was somebody in new zealand that got up at like four or five a.m in the morning oh my Mark. god that crazy that is crazy but thank you <laughs> so thank you to everyone that showed up but um uh, we have a, a, a fascinating interview today, don't we? Tell us, tell us more about our amazing guest today. 
Uh, Leslie Thompson, uh, whose first novel, Seven Miles from Sydney, was published in 1987. And it was one of London City Limits books of the year. And she's uh, her, her other book, Kind of Vanishing, won the People's Book Prize. But it's the Detective's Daughter series that's been her smash hit. It's sold 850,000 copies. Uh, and it's been Sunday Times bestseller. She's done amazingly well. This is there's some extraordinary stuff in here. So we, we discuss why Leslie took a 20 year break between books, um, how she was inspired by her builders and the world around her, and the role that psychogeography plays in her work. Brilliant stuff. Well, let's jump in and listen to the amazing Leslie Thompson. Leslie Thompson, welcome to the bestseller experiment. How are you today? I'm very good, considering it's raining. I've got the builders in. Actually, they're fantastic, so that's all right. Oh. But it's, um, never stopped raining all this morning, having been beautiful yesterday. So Yeah, I know. We picked a right one, didn't we? Uh, I want to come to your builders in a minute. We're, uh, I've got a little comment about your builders, so I will come to that in a moment. But first of all, first of all, tell us about, and I've got a copy of this here, that for folks on YouTube, have a look at that. That is a beautiful, beautiful cover. Tell us about your new book, The Companion. Okay, well... Um, it takes place in a country house. Um, it's kind of, I mean, my mind, to my mind, it's Christie-esque. It's a sort of modern Agatha Christie, I think would probably, I mean, who I just love. Um, and it's, um, the flat, the house, is, the house has been converted into flats, um, which sounds all very lovely. And all these people have bought expensive flats with expensive maintenance fees, etc. But they will hate each other. <laughs> um, into this midst comes... The aforesaid, the companion, who is a young man who doesn't have very much money, but he has kind of aspirations and world fant fantasies, really, about being a lord. Um, and he indeed sometimes describes himself as a lord if he signs in anywhere or whatever. <laughs> and he's joined um, a, a, an organisation which seems to have a very worthy objective, which is matches um, people up with older people who need a companion. Um, and have a room that they can let at a peppercorn rent to whoever it happens to be. Hmm. Timothy doesn't have much money, so he is very happy to uh, to join this organisation called Cuckoo's Nest and um, sign up. And he gets to sign up with a, a retired solicitor who lives in Black Lock Hall, which is this country house. Uh, and really, you know, I think sinister forebodings start right with the book opening really because you know who's who's most at risk the companion or the person who he's living with or the other people in the house considering that there's no love lost between the neighbors yeah. and then the murders start well the the murders sort of start from page one the opening is very it's heartbreaking really because it's uh, it's a mother saying goodbye to her husband and son and we know she's never going to see them again. And it's the, just, just that last line in that first chapter. It's, it's you know, her blaming herself. It's, um, I mean, it's immediately gripping, but it's also heartbreaking as well, isn't it? Yes, and I don't think, I think personally as this, this writer, me, I don't lose track of that. I mean, when you're writing, mm. I think you're almost, I am almost anyway, psychopathic. You just <laughs> put it down. You know, because if you were constantly thinking, well, that's not very nice, I won't put that, oh, that would be horrid. You don't. Um, you don't get a story doesn't happen, but mm. um, the, one of the reasons I write crime fiction is is to study or explore, if you like, um, grief and loss, um, and through murder particularly, um, and what happens to the people left behind, um, and what does that? What is the measure of that loss? And I don't think I think it's really I never lose track of the victims. It's not mm. a puzzle. I mean, you do you know the reader will want to know who did what. But I don't think of it as a puzzle. I think of it as a story, a tale of tragedy, and then hopefully some kind of restoration. Mm. No, it's, it's, it's incredible stuff. And, and in the book, there are there are themes of loneliness, and you've got strangers thrown together by circumstances. Well, like you described Blacklock Hall, this place where everyone's thrown together and they all hate each other. Where did that come from? Tell us about that. Well, I, it, it, as often happens with me, I make I made it up, <laughs> right? Um, and I I, um, I thought right. Well, you know, what would happen if you had a bunch of people living in a house like this in the middle of nowhere, because it is a country mansion, or it was rather. And, and uh, I thought, well, you know, it sounds idyllic, but nothing's idyllic. 
Mm. I mean, that's what you learn as you get older, unfortunately. And a um, friend of ours lives in a house, um, I'm allowed to say it's Sheffield Park House in Sussex. Um, and I was telling him um, you know, about my idea because and he'd offered me to come around. I mean, I've seen the house already, but you know, he gave me a lovely exploration of the basement and everywhere. And he, just, I said, well, you know, the thing about this house is the neighbours don't like each other. And he said, oh, yeah, that's pretty realistic. And I don't want to dump him in it because I think many of the neighbours do love it, do like each other there. But, you know, there's one or two that um, in the outlying regions of the of the complex that aren't so keen on each other. And um, so, you know, reality is you get a group of people together in a, in a situation, there's going to be tensions, aren't there? It's just there. So it's, you know, out of that comes drama. Absolutely. So that's, Absolutely. That's kind of where that idea came from. But I thought of it and then it proved to be true, which happens a lot to me, I think, and other writers I know, you know, it is like there's nothing new under the sun and you're a bit astonished to discover something unfolding in the news that you had thought of or somebody's response to something that you had already written. I mean, I'm not a clairvoyant. It's not Mystic Meg sitting here, but, you know, it all kind of, um, I think if you're very tuned in to the way life works, your imagination, I mean, you're a writer, so you know, your imagination follows the paths that they follow in life, really. Mm. So, very true. Very true. I saw in the acknowledgements as well that you, you you said that psychogeography partly inspired this book. Can you tell us Can you tell us what that is and, and how it inspired you? Yeah, I'll try to. It's one of these things that, um, well, I, it, I think of it as kind of like we all have the paths we take, I, I mean, literal paths, uh, physical paths paths journeys to work journeys to see people and there are different ways you might go and we choose different we choose what the part that we choose the journey path that we prefer and as we do that as we take those journeys we're having ideas and thoughts maybe something's happening and then if you take that journey again follow that route along that route are the associations and the memories of the previous times a sort of palimpsest if you like of mm-hmm. all the different journeys you've taken and then you start to prefer some journeys to others for whatever reason, maybe because the last time you walked that route, you didn't feel very good. So walking that route today would make you feel a bit gloomy. So you go a different way. Um, and then that, I mean, that's sort of a very kind of top level description. Um, I first wrote about it in Detective's Daughter, where Jack, um, who is a London underground train driver, finds a an A to Z on the seat when he's going through the train to check that it's empty and all the passengers have left so he, he can, as they say, stable it. There's this tatty old A to Z line there and he picks it up and he starts leafing through it and he discovers that on each page there's a shape. And actually, although I've never actually said this, this well, he works it out, but you never actually know what it says. Um, the shapes actually spell out a sentence um, and he starts to walk the sentence, if you like. Right. So when on his days off, he follows the roots of this on the A to Z and we meet him as he's coming towards the end of the, the last few pages and the parts of London he therefore has had to go to because, of course, he's walked all of the areas of London, if not the actual streets. Um, and I, that, I kind of came up with that idea myself, but then I discovered there was a discipline called psychogeography, mm. which does map our roots. And I mean, now we have Google to help us, so we can actually see our shapes. Mm. When I was first writing about this, I remember going to a, well, I was taking part in an event where I was giving a talk and then someone else, I think they were doing a study at Sussex University. And they, at that time, they were wiring people up to walk certain routes. And then you saw the shapes of the routes. Well, now, if you carry your phone with you, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're your own uh, surveillance machine, aren't you? So, yes. um, but so you can actually see where you went. Um, and I, I'll, I'll give up my privacy for that because I find it fascinating to, to map one's life through one's walking. Fantastic. So that's my kind of that, that's probably my interpretation of psychogeography. I'm sure many podcasts of your podcast listeners will take issue with that perhaps <laughs> well it's it's um I mean, when it comes down to it, setting is is so important to you, isn't it? Setting is is a is a tremendous part of the story. And and uh, tell us about um some of the most important settings for your books. Well, I guess really going right back again to the detective's daughter, um, the River Thames, um, mm. mass and a massive 
Charles Dickens fan, as and as well as um, Wilkie Collins, kind of Victorian literature generally, the sort of lamp lit, cobbled, glistening cobbled streets, that, that kind mm. of thing. Um, I grew up by, near the river in Hammersmith. It was, and I had a friend who lived right, right next to it, um, the River Thames. And uh, I spent a lot of time with us, us gang of kids kind of around the river and learnt words like pontoon and the smell of the mud and, and mm. seeing the tide go out and all the flotsam and jetsam sort of covered in green slimy mud that was left there. Um, I think we were, well, I was going to say we were the original mudlarks, but of course we were because that was in the Victorian times. But yeah. Um, yeah. So the first few novels do feature the Thames and I think rivers in general. I live near a river now in Lewis. I live near the River Ouse. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've also set a... Um, a novel um, in Tewkesbury, which is uh, near the confluence of the Seven and the, um, oh dear, what's the Shakespearean, oh, the, the no, it's the River in Tewkesbury. Yes, thank Are you. you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, rivers are very important. I mean, in this book, I guess what, what also I love is the South Downs in Sussex, which is, mm. say, where I live. Um, I love to trot out there with my dog and just you know walk into the hills it's fantastic and so this novel is set in in the south downs but it's also got woods nearby um i mean it's got the ingredients of a creepy story i suppose but those are it, location is very important and including a heath it has what i've called deadman's heath but it's really a kind of mashup of the various heaths that we have around here which are ancient you know they're right well eons old um, and all the little, all the flowers that grow there, and the sense of silence and space. Although you're really not that far from um, civilization or a town, mm. um, I think. Yeah, I think really location is almost like it, 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 it. It's incredibly important to my novels. The atmosphere is incredibly important. Excellent stuff. I also read that inspiration for you can really come from anywhere. I saw a note that you said, currently I'm quizzing the guys building our extension. See, I told you we'd come back to your builders. In a future story, I'll include the fraught skip delivery in the pouring rain that I watched last week. So your ideas radar is always on, is it? Yes, it is, yes. I, I mean, I, I'd say to any writer listening to this, you know, don't think that not, and if, you know something's not important. Everything, mm. everything is grist to the mill, as I'm sure you think. You know, I mean... You know, you learn something new every time. I mean, you know, it just, I teach creative writing. And I remember years ago, on an MA, I remember years ago, um, the students had to leave to go to an induction at the library in the first week of their new term. And one of them came back and said, oh, they didn't have any books on creative writing there. And I said, yeah, but that library is full of, like, books on architecture, clock mm-hmm. making, mm-hmm. pottery. You know, that's what you want. You don't need yeah. books on creative writing. That's your bit of it, <laughs> um, which, as the term went on, they all got that. I mean, I just think, you know, around you all the time is drama is happening. Mm. And, um, yeah, these, I mean, these builders are just great. We've known them for years. And they, they explain all the words that, you know, they, they, they tell us the terms for what they're doing. So I learned things like um, a pad stone or um, acro, an acro, which I thought might be something you got when you, you know, misbehave from the government, but it's <laughs> one of those big metal poles that holds the house up, which we've all seen at some stage. And scarily, we had about eight of them recently, but they like, all gone now, thank God, I still <laughs> felt a bit. Um, and just the whole, all the processes, watching Liam laying bricks, for example, you know, the absolute deft skill that he was using to mm. take out the, some cement on his trowel and then with a flick of the wrist, laying it along the brick and then putting the brick and then the level. I just love watching all that and then learning the terms. And it's just, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's, as we know, there are lots of opportunities for a crime story with building because I mean, patios come to mind, you know, (laughs) Um, but just even the process of it means you've got the terminology for stuff. I think it's always good. The more, you know, it's not just knowing lots of words when you're writing, it's knowing, terminology too i think hmm. so yeah wonderful let's talk about your career because this is this is extraordinary stuff i, I want to go back your first book was published in 1987 which at the time of recording is 35 years ago seven miles from sydney yeah 
Then there's a, you've co-write a book with Sue Johnson, who's the actress from Brookside and the Royal Family. And then there's nothing for nearly 20 years. And I'd like to focus on, on what happened there. So seven miles, because you, you lived in Australia for a time. So seven miles yeah, from about Sydney. A year. Right, right. Yes, it's, I did. I lived, I lived briefly in Manly. Um, well, I was staying with a friend in Manly. I actually had a flat in Sydney itself, but I stayed in a flat I stayed, um, not a flat, stayed with a friend in Sydney who, um, well, she was one of the bis- biggest booksellers there at the time. And in fact, still is. The, the bookshop's there still, Abbey's Bookshop. Um, and uh, what it said when you came across on the ferry from um, the mainland was, welcome to Manly, seven miles from Sydney and a thousand miles from Care." And I just <laughs> love that. It's kind of cheesy, but it's, you know. And, and this murder story takes place in Manly. So I kind of thought that's the title. It's got to be. Um, I don't often make up my own titles. I'm not very good at it, but I'm, I did make that one up. Well, I mean, you know, used it. and I'm rather pleased with it. But yeah, that was my first novel. And the 20 year thing. Um, well, I think part of that was, um, I mean, Seven Miles from Sydney did well, but not like give up a day job. Well, just right. OK, you know, Um and then various things happened. Uh, my partner died. My dad died. And I also felt I ought to get a proper job. So there was a kind of combination. I didn't write during that time, but in my, to my mind, I mean, there's two novels she's pointing upwards, but actually this is my writing shed, so there's only sky there. But in our attic, there are two novels um, that, I, that haven't seen the light of day, and I really don't think they will now. So I was writing in that time, mm. but I think I just wasn't, really there as it was as it were and then I got a proper job as it I, which I was always getting jobs in order to write and then they turned into careers so um I got a job selling internet connections in the day when only I mean only me and the woman also selling them had an email account so we emailed each other because <laughs> nobody else had them nobody else had heard of them <laughs> so it was kind of like you know it, 1996 this was and they were just coming about um and that job, which was just selling, you know, over the phone, it wasn't much selling to be done. People rang up, you took their account details, you sent them out a little cardboard envelope with all the details on it and a disc to put in their yes. amp spread or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, and then it grew and grew. So that by the time I left, about six, seven years later, it was a massive um, business with, and I was managing one of the buildings. I was a, cust- I was a customer services manager, a sales manager. Um, and then I went on to be a consultant for, for another company. And then I thought, yeah, but I want to write. And I was, I, I felt all the time a slight headache almost, just a, an ennui, you know. I wasn't really where I wanted to be. It wasn't, um, wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted to do. You know? Well, I mean, what, what, what kind of makes it, well, I mean, I think a lot of people can relate to that, but you had a taste of it. You had been published. You'd had a book out there. You must have thought, great, this is it. Off I go. So, the desire to get back to to that kind of dream must have been really strong. It was. Um, but, you know, it takes a lot of discipline to write, as everybody out there will know. Um, and in that 20 years, so much was happening. Um, well, I mean, doing the sort of job I was doing, it was very long hours. I was commuting as well. And I was writing. And, I, you know, so there, was, there wasn't as if I wasn't type. you know, my fingers weren't on the keyboard, if you like. But um, I... And publishing in that time had also changed a lot. So the company that published me initially had been bought up and then the editor that had been there had gone. Uh, another editor liked my book at a different publisher, but that didn't come to pass because she left. I mean, you know, that it, yeah, there were yeah. lots of things. And I think it's important to say this to listeners, you know, that you're, you, you never can sit back on laurels. The only laurels you can sit back on are your own personal satisfactions as a writer. You can, you can say to yourself, I'm pleased with that. I'm mm. proud of it. You can't be sure that today, tomorrow will be like today. I mean, I'm very lucky. I've literally just signed a contract for another book. But, you know, they, they'll always be the last one. Mm. And, and unless you absolutely go stratospheric and, and then you still might want to stop. But, you know, whatever. You, you know, it, it, It's a tough old business, so I suppose. Um, but I just kept going and you've got to keep going. And that was, uh, and I did, and this is the point. So I wrote this book, which took seven years. I, I was, uh, there was, um, I think one of your previous podcasts talks about somebody, I think, who'd written 12 books. And one of them took like a long, quite a few years to write. And after that it was a year. Mm. Well, so kind of vanishing took me seven years. And it was published by a small press 
not that small, it has to be said. It won the People's Book Prize, which mm. meant I got snapped up by a larger press. And I then had to write and have had to do ever since, and this is 10 years ago now, a novel a year. So forget that seven years, you know, that. Yes. Which yes. is well, fine. I'd rather do it that way, to be honest. You know, well, that was it. I was, I was, I was going to say, you know, you did because you were, I believe you're reading for an MA in English literature when you wrote A Kind of Vanishing. And then you win yeah. the People's Book Prize. You get this blurb for me and Rankin. You know, the book takes off. You're picked up by a bigger publisher. And then you kick off the Detective's Daughter series. And, and it's like one a year, pretty much from 2013 to 2021. That must have been the dream come true, surely. Yeah. Yes, it was. And I mean, Detective's Daughter um, became Amazon's longest number one uh, as an as a e-book for that year. It was wow. number one. I, I felt a bit like wet, wet, wet. You might be too young for this. <laughs> no, yeah. Everlasting single. In, Love is in all the around, 90s. yes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, Leslie was all around <laughs> for a bit. Um, well, you know, in my mind anyway. And, and, it, and it, it was the year that J.K. Rowling came out as Robert Gil- Galbraith. And when they realised this Galbraith novel had been wallowing in the lower part of the charts, and then, then it was proved to be her. And I said, well, that's it. I won't be number one anymore. And I was right. I was knocked off my perch and put on num- as a number two. And then the following week, I was back at hey. number one. So I can <laughs> say that I've, I've knocked... Out the way, Joe. Out the way. <laughs> so uh, that was rather lovely. So those are the laurels one sits on, as we, you know, going back to my earlier point. You know, um, you know, that's jolly nice. I shan't forget that. But um, yeah, so that's right. I I suddenly did very well indeed. Um, and then again, you know, the next book didn't do as well, and so on. It's just how it is. You know, mm. it's it's a tough business. Mm. I'd like to talk about your writing writing routine. Do you still go away to the Cotswolds? Do you still sort of shut yourself away from the world to to write, or you've? Oh, I see you've got a shed now. Is that is that part of a new routine? Yes, it is. Um, we moved house last year, and my dream of having my own writing shed um, came true. So this is where I am at the moment, which is why you can't hear drilling and banging because the fights it would be <laughs> a bit difficult. Um, yeah. Um, so my, my routine. Um, is that I, you know, get up in the morning pretty early and go on, take Alfred out for a dog walk with my partner Melanie or without, and um, we've got that we, we're part of a dog group, walking group, which sounds hideous. It isn't. It's a bunch of friends who, over the years, we've got to really like each other. We go to the pub together. We do other things. Uh, so when you go out at seven o'clock in the morning, you know you're going to have a really nice social time talking mm. about life with people. I do that. Come back. Uh, breakfast. And I'm at my desk by latest nine, I suppose, sometimes earlier, mostly nine. Work, have a coffee at 11. These are all the rituals of writing. Right. You know, I mean, that sounds boring, but they're really all the things you just, they matter. You know, I've, I know coffee's going to be at 11, whether or not it's going to be a, <laughs> one I buy or one I make. Um, and then carry on till about one, have lunch, during which I listen to an episode of The Archers, so that's the length of lunch, mm-hmm. and then back to work for a bit. If I'm writing as I am at the moment, a first draft, in the afternoon I'll probably research, just read, and another dog walk. If I'm writing the last draft, or I, it's written and I'm editing it, redrafting, then my brain can cope with that in the afternoon, so I'll do that. I can't do original text much after about 2 o'clock. Just yeah. Yeah. It's not ideal. I can, but I tend to rewrite that the next morning. So it's not worth it, really. Yeah. 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 There is a lovely video on your website of this place that you had in the Cotswolds where you would basically shut yourself away, you know. And as you said, you might pop out, take the dog for a walk, pop to a cafe, get some get some freshly baked goods and then back to writing. Uh, but you're recreating that now in, in the shed, essentially. Yes, um, the, the Cotswold House still exists, but we've been renting it out the last couple of years. With lockdown, we couldn't go. Well, we, and it was empty, but now we're renting it out. It's all part of making sure that, you know, the wolf is not scratching at the door, really, basically. Because, <laughs> you know, another thing to say to writers, that wolf is never far away, mm. to be aware of it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Constantly uh, circling and prowling. Uh, there's, yes. <laughs> there's, you put a lovely note in the acknowledgements as well. You said, when I'm teaching creative writing, I suggest that students write the novel they want to read. Can you elaborate on that a bit? I think it's wonderful advice. Mm. Well, I just think, you know, I get asked a lot, both at events and while teaching, 
um, you know, should I write this kind of novel? Well, is that likely to sell if I do this? And if I was, and you just, I just say, look, if you're thinking like that, I mean, maybe that will happen. I, I won't say it won't, but it certainly would have worked for me. Then you're outside your story. Um, and you need to be inside your story because if you don't believe what's going on in your story, then it's going to be pretty hard for other people to really take on the plausibility of it. Um, so I sort of think, well, you know, you can't write the sort of novel that, say, you, Mark, would like because, well, well, I mean, okay, I've been talking to you, so that's a bad example. There's somebody who you don't know who's mm. crossing the street. How do you know what they like to read? Um so you, you have to write the kind of novel you yourself would want to read, that you mm. yourself would become absorbed by. And, and if you're writing that sort of novel, you presumably are absorbed while you're writing it, which means there's a chance your readers will be too. Um, and I just always encourage students to, and would-be writers, to stay within the story. Yes, it's important to think about the market up to a point, but if you're really concentrating on the market, for the sort of novel I write, which are very character-led, You've got to be concentrating on the characters and their mm. motivations and you know what they're likely to do and what's likely to happen because they did that. You can't be thinking, oh, I wonder if this will sell, or you know, I wonder, if, you know, this is what would this be called? A crime novel? And if it is, well, you just, I think that just takes you away from the story. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. That it's it's something um I I struggle with a lot where you're writing something you think this is so strangely specific to me. No one else is going to be interested in this. But then I read stuff that has come from a very specific place from someone else, but it has a weird universality to it. People, I think that that universality is in the specifics, is in is in that thing about you that no one else can do. I think it is because, you know, I mean, we are individual. Um, of course we are. but. I think one of the joys of reading, as well as writing, is to discover the commonality and to discover how common the commonality is, I guess. Mm. So, you know, I mean, yes, it might be very specific to you, but it'd be very specific to several thousand others, too, by that, yeah. you know, likely, whether here or the States or any other country, really. And I think it, it's just having the confidence to, to see that. But also, I think one of the jobs one has as a writer is to look at the... Um, the way in which your specific experience would have a resonance for others. Mm. Otherwise, it, if it's otherwise, it's a diary, really, isn't it? And that's yeah. a different concept again. Yeah, yeah. It's all about digging down to those basic human truths. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, wonderful stuff. What's coming next from you, Leslie? Will there be more detectives, daughter novels, or more mm. standalone novels like The Companion, or a mixture of both? I, I hope a mixture of both, but. Um, the one I'm writing at the moment is a number nine in the Detective's Daughter series. Um, currently, well, it's either called the Charnel House or the Wendy House or something else my editor prefers. It's actually about, it starts off with a skeleton being found in a wartime pillbox, um, which lots of people might not know, and that might include you, what a pillbox is. Oh, they're all over the place around here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> here as well. Exactly. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Um, and I just thought, oh, that's crying out to be in a novel, really. Mm. Um, and so basically Jack and Stella go on holiday with his kids and the kids find the skeleton and keep it a secret for quite a while because it's their friend. But eventually um, Stella discovers a picture of it on the phone that they're not supposed to have uh, or not supposed to have had with them um, because it's just – anyway. Um, and that the story takes place from there. It's a, war, it, it's a mixture of the war, uh, Second World War, um, and present day, um, because the pillbox obviously is a, um, a home guard um, defence building to hide in and, and then shoot at Nazis when they came, which yes. they never did in the end, as we know. Um, and as you say, there are lots of them dotted around the countryside, and they're pretty much hidden, a lot of them, amongst brambles, as mm. is this one. Um, but the kids refer to it as their Wendy house. And I couldn't call it the pillbox because that just sounds silly, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's, it's funny. There's one in my next book as well. Uh, and uh, where I, I live in Kent, and of course, this would have been the front line of any uh, Operation Sea Line or any invasion. So they're all Absolutely. over the place here. And, yeah, and there's... Yeah. 
uh, I found a Shire book. You know, those little Shire books. Uh, there's one on pillboxes, you know, and all the different kinds of structures and how they were built. I found it so useful. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, um, it's little bits of history everywhere. I thought I'd just make that clear for any overseas listeners who are going, what the hell is a pillbox? <laughs> yes, quite. No, I mean, it's something that, and there are lots of, lots of Londoners too, because you don't, I mean, I think there might be one or two in London, but they are mm. mostly uh, along the coast. And I'm, I'm along the, I mean, Lewis is not on the coast. But mm. obviously, it's you know all the countryside around here. They were anticipating they would come up yeah. from the coast, mm. and we've got the tank uh, protectors as well, of course, as but yes. you have. Yes. Um, well, one of my novels is partly set. I mean, they uh, they visit um, which one is it? Oh, it's a companion, I think. Um, they go to Whitstable, which of ah. course is in Kent. It's just up the road. I've just is it really? Yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah. used to. <laughs> Marvellous. Well, I used to live there, so I thought Whitstable's got to be in a novel at some point. So um, <laughs> I have my detective go and visit another detective who lives in Whitstable. So, Wonderful. Um, in fact, I go to visit my old house, which I'm constantly doing this, uh, much to my partner Melanie's, um, I don't know what you'd call it, annoyance, probably a mild term. <laughs> I did set a murderer in our um, sitting room in the Cotswolds. <laughs> which is never, she, she looks at this corner in the room and says... I just can't get out of my head. There's a body there. A body there, yeah. <laughs> we need to we need to do an episode of all the partners of of writers, particularly crime and horror writers, who have to put up with this stuff. <laughs> I think I think that would be a really good one, actually, because I mean, you know, Melly is part of a support group, so, well, not official, but, you know, and Ellie Griffith's husband and her do get together over right. what, you know terriblenesses of being a you know married to writers, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. We yes. might do that. We might do that. Folks, The Companion is out there now. Grab your copy. And, of course, all of Leslie's other books out there. Leslie, it's been an absolute joy speaking to you. Thank you so much and hope to speak to you again soon. Well, that was brilliant. Thanks, Mark. OK. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy that's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy all right mr say we need to talk about this we need to talk about this because this is the first time i think i have ever heard someone talk on the on the podcast in 402 episodes now that they started writing 20 years ago mm. or, or they, they wrote their first thing and then had a 20 year break. Year and break, it suddenly yeah. made me think, actually, we probably don't hear from a lot of these types of people because a lot of these people who did that have maybe never restarted, right? So they mm. don't have a book to talk about. But I know, I know just from anecdotes of some of my friends that they've got that book that they wrote or they did the first draft and it's dusted in their, you know, in their lower cupboard of their desk and they've never even gone back to it. I think this is an incredibly inspiring interview for anyone who's in that situation who's listening to this podcast now thinking yeah my plan is to one day start writing again but they've got something that they wrote 20 years ago maybe 30 years ago maybe five years ago have you mm. come across have you met a lot of people in your in your walk of life anecdotally who kind of have that they started and they kind of either gave up or they just had a long long gap between starting again no this was this was quite new to me, and I think it's quite unusual. You, you get people who maybe have a flurry of activity, publish a handful of books, and then go away. Maybe just do other things. You know, maybe go into teaching, maybe go into other things, or or, or sometimes they write under a pseudonym and write under a different name, but they keep writing. Or you have people who just you know keep plodding on or whatever, or the or the career kind of fades away. I mean, this is something we're talking about in the, in, in the live show as well. Is this is this a job for life? Can you keep this going? And obviously, we're self publishing the opportunity opportunities are there but to have that and of course leslie had reasons for this you know real life reasons well, there always life, will be. life yeah life changing events you know quite harrowing events as well uh where you kind of think well you know i need to be with loved ones i need to look after the people in my life and and we totally you know how many parents can relate to that right now yeah. i mean how many yeah. parents 
you know, we we both know having gone through it, and we're we're all you're, you're at the other end of it, so to speak. Not quite, because I know the kids are still kind of around, aren't they? But and I, and I've my daughter today started high school. My my youngest of my three, right, right. One at uni, one left high school now, and one started high school yesterday. And you do you get when you have kids or something huge happens in your life, which I can relate to on both accounts. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. sometimes your life can just. The life that you planned, the life that you intended, the life that you visualized gets gets interrupted. And I use the word interrupted because I want to think, I want everyone out there who's had their life interrupted as a, when they had dreams of being an author in their 20s or 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s even. Yeah. I want people to realize that it's an interruption, uh, sometimes a very difficult one, but don't think of it as a, an end game that there's always going to be a chance. And maybe that chance for you is today, having listened to Leslie talk about how she did it. Yeah, maybe yeah. that's the spark you needed to say, you know what, I'm going to go for this. Or maybe you know someone, more importantly, I bet you a ton of people listening to right, this right now know at least two, three, five, ten friends that have been in that and, and get them to listen to Leslie's interview and get them to be inspired by getting started again. I can, I can imagine there are people, I mean... No one would blame Leslie if she kind of thought, okay, you know, I had my shot. I had a couple of books published, uh, but that's in the past. But no, she was like, sod it. I'm going back to this. This is the thing that I love. It's the thing that won't go away. Uh, and she rolled her sleeves up and, and got back to it. And uh, in some ways, it's almost harder, you know, because publishers will go, well, you were published 20 years ago. What, well, it's, what went it's, wrong? It's you like know? when you've been out of the job market for 20 years. The oh, question gosh, is, yeah. oh, okay, looking at your resume, you worked. So why, yeah, where have you been the last yeah, It's a big gap years? in your CV here. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Do you yeah, know the yeah. other thing I found really fascinating is Leslie's, a bit of parallel lives happening with me and her because she talked about working for an internet company selling internet connections <laughs> I in, like nine, in 1996. <laughs> And I don't think I've talked, I don't know if I've talked much about this, but that in 1996, I was selling internet connections in the UK. <laughs> I worked for this company. You could have emailed her. You could have been her third email. In her. <laughs> well, I was wondering, I looked, I looked it up because I thought, I wonder if she were, I, I suddenly had this really weird thought of like, I wonder if we were actually in the same company, <laughs> right? Because there were, there were three, four, 500 people. The company was called Pipex Dial. Oh, Pipex right. Pipex yeah. Dial, right. One yeah. of the first, first companies in the UK that offered internet. And then they got bought out by bigger and bigger companies up to the point where MCI bought them out. And then this company, this little like, company called WorldCom bought out MCI. And WorldCom was like, was bigger than Enron as a, a massive, massive financial fraud that happened. And the guy right. that ran Enron is doing life sentences in, in jail right now. But I was out. I got out before that happened because uh, there was nothing to do with me. Um, <laughs> but I can't breathe the thing. <laughs> yeah, just a quick disclaimer there. But, um, but it was really fascinating to you know to go again it, it's publishing a book and then going into like technology like we have a lot of people in the academy that set up a, you know there's one one person who set up a technology company in the academy uh, in the academy set up a technology company um ran that and then once they'd finished that part of their life they then decided right i've, I've done the i've done that bit now i'm going to focus on writing books and become a novelist like post you know not just in retirement but just post kind of like We've got it's, we've got we've got a guest on the podcast who did exactly that as well and went on to be a huge bestseller. So stay yeah, tuned for that. So one, there's folks. all kinds. Yeah. So what, wherever you are in life, I think that the, the thing that I take from Leslie's um, you know inspiring stories, wherever you are in life, even if you've had a long gap in writing, even if you started writing something um, and never really finished it, um, you know, and you've and you've been working towards starting again, I want to put it out there to you today. Is today, or let's give you a day off, is tomorrow the, the <laughs> day when you pull out that dusty notebook or you get your journal out and you write about what you're going to do moving forward? Like what is going to be your goal? Maybe think about what your goal is for the, next, the rest of the year. We've got like a few months left of the year. Don't wait until 2023. Everyone does that. Oh, I'll, I'll do it next year. That's the classic, just putting it off until it's too late, right? And we do that every year. We put it off, put it off, put it off. You know, um, so what are you gonna what are you gonna start between now and the end of this year that will give you momentum into next year, and maybe find you possibly writing once a week or even once a day, and getting to that place where Leslie got to, where she's had this incredible success. I think it's 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 wonderful. Mm, absolutely.
Absolutely. Um, can we talk about psychogeography? Yeah, that was something I've never heard of before. New word for me. <laughs> I love this. I love this. I mean, it's something that I've had a, an interest in. And it's, it is, as Leslie said, it's this thing. It's a connection between people and places and how one affects the other. And as Leslie said, it can be with Leslie mapping your life through movement. You know, those little things in the London A to Z. She was talking about shapes and codes and things and her own connection to rivers like the Thames and the River Ouse. But there's also, I mean, me as a, a writer who writes about the supernatural as well, there's some, there's there's something in the earth sometimes. I mean, Alan Moore, his uh, graphic novel From Hell, which is about Jack the Ripper, um, there's a whole section where the killer takes his accomplice on this tour of London and he's pointing out the symbolism in Hawksmoor's churches and the architecture and their significance. And there's a line where he talks about, you know, the Druids believed locations were empowered by suffering that some have soaked up the despair and the terror that reverberated in the soil and the stones. And, you know, so all of that stuff is, is I love that stuff. I mean, where I live, we mentioned, you know, Leslie mentioned pillboxes, these little concrete structures that were put there to defend the Britain against, you know, the Nazi invasion. They're all round here. There's one just up the road here. You know, there's one, there's one over that way as well, which inspired me to write uh, you know, them into the new, uh, the Ghost of Ivy Barn, the, the new Witches of Woodville book. And Leslie lives in the South Downs, and which is an area I know quite well. So South Downs, you've got the Seven Sisters, which is this winding river. You've got the Long Man of Wilmington, which is oh, this yeah. chalk man. Chalk that. man in, you yeah, know, he... which some people say is an ancient Druid thing. Others say it was put there by the Victorians, you know, who, yeah. you know, discovered it, air quotes. But all <laughs> of these places have this brilliant sense of history. So I think if you're... um. You know, if you're writing with someone that has a very strong sense of place, think about how your characters are affected by that environment and and how they are, uh, how they might affect it as well. And she also mentioned the word um, palimpsest, which applies. A palimpsest is a manuscript. Uh, on which later writing has been superimposed on old old writing. It's where people had to reuse parchment. So they'd write one thing in it and then sort of wipe it down, the vellum, and then they'd write something else on top of it. But you can apply that to places. You know, we've got Recolver here, which is, you know, it once was a Roman settlement and then the church was built on it. So you can see all these different layers in the landscape, and it's absolutely fascinating. But the, this idea of a palimpsest, this can apply you know, to writing to manuscripts. And also you, you'll know this through music. You'll be old, you're old enough to remember four tracks and eight tracks where you oh, record yeah. on tape. Did you ever have a thing on tape where you'd hear something on the other side of the tape and it bled into the music, you yeah. know, something from side B bleeds on side A or, or you get, yeah. you know, a four, on a four track, you get something from track two bleeding into track one, that kind of stuff as well. So this idea that ideas are bleeding into other ideas, this fascinates me. And if you can apply that to your writing, I think, you know, I think you can really add an extra dimension to it. And in many ways, I mean, through the generations of history, we're, you know, I'm bleeding is the wrong word in that sense, but everything that we're doing today is being a result of what we built on top of, or sometimes sideways, or maybe sometimes backwards. But we've 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 laid on top of everything that's gone in our past. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. and I'm reading actually, I'm just coming up to the end of the second longest book I've ever read, Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. What an wow. epic book that and it's all yeah. about, you know, it, yeah, it brings a lot of that in. That's a big psychogeography book, that is. Right? That's, uh, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm yeah. living in that era of like 1125, I think it was. Yeah. And um, I, I, yeah, it just, it, it, it's really powerful in terms of how it can draw you in to mm. that world and, and give, and again, give you an appreciation of like where we are today that we don't have to kind of scrape around for, um, you know, uh, Hit berries and and get <laughs> see, like get get hung for um you know adultery not not that that's one of my issues obviously <laughs> do you know what I mean? just, <laughs> yeah, pick things yeah, randomly but no yeah. i was literally reading that this morning this part i won't spoil it for people that haven't read it but like there's there's all kinds of it does it reminds you of just where you know what we've built in terms of layers and how we've kind of become much more um a much more uh, evolved, should we say, kind of society. And yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating. It really yeah. it really is interesting. Yeah. The other thing that I found really interesting that that Leslie talked about was talking about. We've heard this a number of times, but I think it's worth always repeating when we hear it because it's a good reminder to us all. Write the novel that you want to read, mm. 
And yeah. I really, I really think that's an important one because too many people get, there's always this, this debate and discussion, like you know, what's hot on Amazon right now? What's the next coming trend? And people trying to always second guess it and chasing fashion, but they're always one, you know, one month behind it. But starting with what you want to read is the place, is the starting point. And then you ask yourself the pertinent questions about what you want your novel to, to kind of be or represent. So for people that are thinking about their new book, or maybe you've just, you're about to start one, like, have you asked yourself that question? Do you really want to read that book? Or are you kind of like chasing something which is more of yeah. a commercialized kind of version of what you think you'd actually like to write? So good yeah. reminder, isn't it? Absolutely. The, the thing that Leslie said that I think listeners should take away is, is she said, be inside your story. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't believe it, the reader won't stay inside the story, and you 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 stay inside the story by coming from a place of truth. And it's like I say, it's those things. I mean, this is why the the Woodville books for me are are the most honest sort of representations of me. I know they're about a teenage girl and witches and stuff like that, but the ideas in them are ideas that I want to explore that up till now I thought is no one else is going to read this, are they? And weirdly, it's the most you know successful thing I've done. Um, same with the film Unwelcome. There's, there's stuff in that that I thought, am I... Do I dare talk about this? And it's resonated with so many other people, you know, who've made the film. It hasn't been released yet. It's coming at the end of January now. Never mind. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I'm re uh, I know we've mentioned this a couple of times on the podcast before, but Denise McGahn, who is in the Academy, and I've been working on her book, and her book is about a middle aged woman. Um, I'm not a middle aged woman, uh, but there's stuff in that book that resonates completely and will resonate with people across the whole spectrum of society because it's truthful. It tells the truth. And you recognize that as a reader. We recognize as, as a reader when someone is, is not pretending to be someone else, they are, they are writing from inside their story. And I think something about that clicks and we love that does and actually the a visual that comes up for me is is thinking of an author as a ringmaster of the circus and all around you is the audience like literally you're surrounded by your audience and if you as the ringmaster the the, the person creating the fantastical you know uh, spectacular in front of yourself if if you don't believe if you if you're not fully fully in it as the ringmaster then people are going to get off their seats and walk out of the circus and it's like it's about you know um, being inside, you know, being in the center uh, of that circus, but also holding the audience captive. So they yeah. don't think, ah, this is rubbish, or that's made up, or that's not real, and then they, they leave. Yeah. Yeah. Audiences, I know this from theater, they, they can smell fear. They know when you're a. Uh, they Which know is not when, good you're, when you're a ringmaster when you've got the no. line out because <laughs> they smell fear as well, don't they? they can, yeah. Well, they, they know insincerity. You know, they can smell it, you know, and um, it's like any kind of public facing thing. They they know when it's not for real. So you've got to be, got to be yeah, for real. Absolutely. Now, before we finish up on the discussions, I know we've got a lot of social media, but this, oh, yeah. we have to mention this every time it comes up because it's aspirational for many, many people. The writing shed dream. <laughs> well, you know, it is, it is a dream. It is, it's, um, it's... It's a room of one's own, isn't it? It's it's yeah. uh, just having somewhere where you can lock the door and go. I mean, okay. speaking as, as someone who you know wrote on trains and in laybys for many many years, <laughs> this 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 room that I'm in now is is it's, paradise. It's as yeah. good as it's as good as you can pretty much get. <laughs> that speaks the voice of experience. Do you want to hear some good news, Mister D? Absolutely. Right, social media. Right, I, I, there's so much to discuss. Uh, let's start with Zach Erlocker, uh, who's been you know. Uh, patron supporter and Zach got in touch. He said, grateful to the bestseller experiment for the encouragement to get my first novel, The Man from Mittelwork, completed. Print and audiobook coming in September. Thanks for all you do. Thank you, Zach. Uh, the Man from Mittelwork, I'll put a uh, link in the show notes so you can check this out. This is a book that he's written with his brother, actually. And I'm hoping to get them on the podcast. Probably we, we are chocker until the end of the year, so it might not be till the new year, but we'll hope to get Zach on the show at some point to talk about that because it is an extraordinary journey. So big congrats to Zach uh, for The Man from Mittelwork. Brilliant, Zach. Um, well done. An amazing... Now, look, Mark Hood. Let's talk about Mark Hood. Oh. The, the 200 words a day challenge. Uh, he's finally hit 
a thousand days of writing in a row. That's 635. Well, it's almost 636,000 words. He started back in 2019. He says, it's just second nature now. Get those words down and watch them add up. Thanks to everyone who's cheered me on and supported this journey. A thousand days, Mr. D. Just imagine. I feel like we have to do something to honour that that mantle but i just i mean he's going to keep going though isn't he i mean i know, will, yeah. I know this is i i honestly think mark will be writing for the rest of his life and what he mm. what will be his i mean six hundred and thirty six thousand words you said since when 20 2019 yeah. 2019 that's not even maybe not even three years ago isn't that yeah. insane yeah and his book's getting great reviews as well like uh the war of the worlds um Sequel. Oh, fantastic. Sequels. Yeah. So for anyone who thinks they can't do it, I remember there's there's actually we should we should um remind people that there is a Academy All Stars interview with Mark Hood uh, where he talks about how this started. And I think at the time he he was he was at eight hundred days or something, wasn't he? But um go and go and hunt that down on the I'll on put the, a link in I'll put a link in the show notes. So yeah, you can, you can check that out, folks, because that is a that's a good Because that's what happens episode. when you start it just it literally started. Like they in fact, there is there is that really famous saying, isn't it? A journey, you know, journey. Of, what was it? A thousand miles starts with the first step. The first step, yeah. and this is what the two hundred word challenge is. It's about the journey of getting to a thousand days of writing is by starting by writing one two hundred word challenge tomorrow, and that's what Mark did. That's where Mark started, and now he's he's closing on on what well, two two thirds of a million words in a few yeah. years unbelievable so brilliant mark well done and thank you again for keeping going and thank you for inspiring everyone else to, to keep going as well we've got a lot of people chasing mark now you know that mark yeah, <laughs> Go on. yeah me included it's start, me included, it started yeah. something it started yeah. something it's brilliant Definitely. like wacky races uh we had a lovely note from tracy montague uh who's a, a member of the bxp group and patron supporter now tracy says i got my first non-form good rejection for my near future thriller she said, I'm not exactly happy, but consoled and at least wanted to share as it's a first for me. Now, this is from it's a rejection from Jack Renison of Bookature, who's just started their science fiction fantasy uh, imprint, which and we're hoping to get Jack on the podcast in a few weeks. So stay tuned for that as well. But Jack said of Tracy's book, it's a fantastic concept delivered with humor and incredibly sharp writing, but I'm focused on particular subgenres as I start Bookature's new list. Uh, so this doesn't sit naturally in those areas. So, you know. Someone out there likes it. And I've got to say, I've worked on Tracy's book as well. And it's a cracking read. It's really, really good fun. So, you know, hang in there, Tracy. This this just feels, you know, that first non-form rejection where someone actually likes it but doesn't want to take it on. It's frustrating, yeah. but it's it's validation, isn't it? Congratulations, Tracy. We always talk about this. It's like it's yeah. a badge of honour. Congratulations on being rejected. We are changing the way we deal with rejection it's it's a badge of honor and it's amazing that you're out there making it happen putting it in front of people and getting those rejections because you've got to get a few we all know that you've got to get a yeah. few before you get the you get the yes please so keep going and build on that and great great feedback as well so yeah well done and uh, another longtime supporter of the podcast is Paul Arduin, who re- writes the Reluctant Coroner series, uh, the uh, the Fenway Mysteries, Fenway Stevens Mysteries. And uh, he said, uh, I said, I've had my first live author event since the pandemic started. It was my, at my local Barnes & Noble near Sacramento, California. When I decided to self-publish, I figured I'd never be in bookstores. And I didn't think to care, I didn't think I'd care about it, but he says, I have to say, I got a little emotional seeing my books on the table next to Gillian Flynn, Paula Hawkins and Janet Ivanovich. The event was a success and Barnes and Noble sold out of book one. That's something wow. else, isn't it? You know, well done, it's just yeah. amazing. That yeah. is a really important moment. You know, we talk about the milestones um, in an author's life and that moment where you see your book on a shelf or book on a table mm-hmm. And then it's mixed in with all those amazing names that you've always kind of maybe like dreamt of being being yeah. somewhere close to even on a bookshelf. Brilliant. So well done, Paul. Thank you for sharing that story as well. Now, we've mentioned him once already on the podcast. This is, uh, this is Andrew Chapman, who his uh, mask collector became a bestseller uh, on Whoa. Amazon. Uh, so he says... But if it's free, does it still count as a bestseller? He he posted about it in a Books of Horror Facebook group, and then it shot to number one on uh, the bestsellers in horror fiction classics. And it's it's part as a Kindle Unlimited number one bestseller. So yes, that blooming well does count, Andrew. Does. Congratulations for that. And that's the Mars Collector there. So yeah, that's fantastic. And last but by no means least, again we mentioned him on the show, but Mark Hood. 
made a declaration for his, on behalf of his partner, Martine, who has since joined the BXP group. Uh, you may remember this a few weeks ago on the podcast. She was going to write 5,000 words, a synopsis, synopsis and a personal statement. Uh, and she did it. She absolutely did it. She submitted everything three days early. Uh, so it's um, she's reeling. So And she's, you know, joined the BXP group. She's got that support group there. Yeah. So, folks, if you want what Martine's got, what Mark has got, and congratulations, Martine. Um Come and come support us on Patreon. Come and join the Academy. That it's all about finding that community and getting that support. Absolutely. Brilliant news. Absolutely wonderful. And if you have any good news that you would like to share, this is what we're all about on this podcast. So please send us in your good news. Uh, even if it's a good news about rejection, whatever it, whatever yeah. it is, move, any news that's you moving forward in a, in a positive way that feels that you're developing as an author, you're getting closer to that dream, uh, you know, whatever that is for you, let us know because we would like to celebrate with you because you know what? There's not enough good news in this world right now, and we yeah. want to find it. So please, please email us. You can get you can get hold of us by going to the website, and there's a contact form on the website. Click on a contact button, fill out that form. Mark and I read all of them. And whilst you're there, folks, whilst you're there, click on the newsletter um, link and put your name in there, and then we'll send you an email each week of the new episode that's come out, what, what we've learned from it, what you could learn from it, plus all lots of other really exciting news about the podcast as well. So uh, don't forget that. And Mark, if people want to contact us on social media. Yeah, come and find us on Facebook. We're Bestseller Experiment on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We are at Bestseller XP. If you've enjoyed the show today, subscribe on your podcast catcher. Give us a rating or a review. They, they help us become more visible help to inspire other people and uh yeah any good nice words spread spread the word tell your tell your writing group tell your friends tell stop random strangers in the streets what whatever it takes uh kind of just tell people <laughs> <laughs> actually i'll tell you stuff. what tell you what last couple of months our figures have been up actually so i shouldn't yeah, complain things are going but, bonkers um, yeah yeah it's, it's all good so thank you for <laughs> thank you for spreading word and also if you've been inspired by mark hood and his thousand days of consecutive writing of 200 mm. words you too can join in it's 200 wordchallengecom and like mark said if you are interested in finding out more about the academy it's academy.bestsellerexperiment.com and welcome again to all of our amazing academy members our academates who are starting this week and i'm incredibly excited it's wonderful such an amazing group of people that, that have come on board as well so so mark i hope you have a technology free and uh lead free week <laughs> have a happy writing couple of weeks yes. and, and we look forward to joining you again this time next week folks so it's a goodbye from mark one and goodbye from mark two bye, -bye. Goodbye.